Again, welcome everybody. Um, just a short introduction first uh, to ISIS, for those of you who don't know us. The International Solar Energy Society is a nonprofit UN accredited membership NGO. Our vision is 100% renewable energy for all used efficiently and wisely. ISIS represents a diverse membership of academics, researchers, energy practitioners, consultants, students, businesses, and advocates. We work together with like-minded organizations from countries all around the world to advance the renewable energy transformation. We are a membership society, and there are many benefits to joining ISIS. You can find out more about what our work on our homepage. Some of the benefits include exclusive access to presentations and webinar recordings, such as today's in the, in the webinar archive. ISIS members also get discounts and even free registrations to ISIS events and our partner events. Every month, ISIS also publishes a newsletter for our members where you can follow our progress and share your news as well. Mm, I, members can also subscribe to our academic journal, Solar Energy, which is our flagship publication. Um, so we welcome those who are not yet members to join today and to support our work. For those who are already an ISIS member, we thank you for your support. Now some brief information about the webinar today and especially the Q&A section before we start. Uh, we have three presentations for you this, this, this evening or this afternoon, this morning, depending on where you are in the world. Um, our expert speakers will give their presentation, and this will be followed by a, Q and a question and answer um, part of the webinar for you, the audience. We invite you to send in your questions, and we're looking forward to your participation. When sending in your question, you can do so in your, directly on your panel on the, on the GoTo screen. Um, please write who the question is for and keep your questions short and precise. Our moderator, Bearable Epp, will be moderating the question and answer part of the webinar. So please feel free to start sending in your questions anytime throughout the webinar. Now I'm happy to do, introduce you to our moderator for today, Bearable Epp. Bearable will introduce you to our speakers and guide us through the question and answer, as I said, session. Uh, Bearable is the founding and managing director of the German consultancy Solrico for Solar Market Research and International Communications. She is responsible for the international newsletter on the web portal www.solarthermalworld.org, which reports exclusively about market and technology trends in the solar heating and cooling sector. Now I'm very happy to hand over to Barbel. Barbel, thank you again for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jenny. Good afternoon to everybody. I'm happy to welcome you to this uh, webinar on thermal energy. As you know, this is a very dedicated um, topic for the energy transition storage materials and thermal storage in general. And we have three very dedicated speakers today with us who um, will present us their know-how and their work. Now, I think I want to show you some slides on um, the IA solar heating and cooling program. If I get the, oh yes, that's it. I hope it's all visible. Well, the IEA Solar Heating and Cooling Program, which is co-organizer of this webinar, is um, one of the very established and um, first IEA technology collaboration programs. We have about 20 country members, the European Commission, and four international organizers. That means that um, more than 400 experts from all five continents group, and they work in particular solar research-oriented projects. And I name some of these topics. This is a wide range. We work on PV thermal, district heating, historic buildings, um, industrial solar heat, industrial water management, facade integration, and neighborhood planning. And as we will hear today about thermal storage material development. You can have uh, different channels to join and to get to know our work. There are these webinars which are also recorded and you can find the recordings and the presentations afterwards on our um, website under this link. We actually uh, regularly interview experts um, on their topics and on our conferences, and we have added some new interviews now on this playlist, which you find on the IEA SHC YouTube channel. Also, on request of partner countries, we organize online trainings. The last ones have been in China, South Africa, and UK. 
You can visit our website. Feel free to answer questions to our secretariat and follow us on social media, which is the hashtag IASHC or a LinkedIn group, which is also under our name as well as YouTube. We have a webinar today, as I already said, and Jenny said as well, material and components for thermal energy storage. Actually, TASK is the word for an international research project within the IAA Solar Heating and Cooling Program. So we give them numbers to be easier to communicate about them internally. Our first speaker is Dr. Wim van Helden. He heads the Thermal Energy Storage Group of the Austrian Research Institute IA Intec since 2014. He is originally from the Netherlands, where he studied physics and did his PhD at the Eindhoven University of Technology. He was 11 years responsible for the group, which was called Thermal Systems in the Built Environment on the Research Center in the Netherlands. Together, WIM is co-chairing this Task 58, which is a three years project and ends at the beginning of 2020. WIM will give us an introduction into the general work of this international research platform, which is covering all sorts of storage tanks. Hope, Wim, you have your screen ready and you can give us your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bärbel, for, for this kind introduction. Um, my presentation it will come now on screen. F5, yes. This uh, first part, as said, is a, a general introduction on the work on uh, materials and component development for thermal energy storage, or Task 58, Annex 33. Uh, what you will hear and see in this part is, um, say, the motivation for doing thermal energy storage, how the uh, Annex is uh, and Task is working, which uh, uh, some examples of, of work that we do and then also some future steps that are needed to um, make sure that the technologies of uh, compact thermal energy storage are being brought into practice. To start with, the, uh, the purpose of energy storage is that uh, the uh, technology is a sort of enabling technology for a lot of fields, for instance, for solar thermal or for district heating, or for biomass, solar thermal power. Thermal energy storage is a key enabling technology. This is the, the left-hand side of the picture. Uh, another reasoning for having thermal energy storage is in the so-called flexible sector coupling. Uh, more and more renewable energy is being generated in the form of electricity. And to be able to um, benefit from this electricity in several sectors, so, for instance, the heating and cooling sector, but also mobility, energy storage is needed, and especially thermal energy storage is needed uh, to provide uh, heating and also cooling to the heating and cooling sector. There are three main principles for heat storage. Most known is the sensible heat storage, uh, and to the right you see a picture of the amount of stored heat as a function of the temperature of the storage medium. And for sensible heat, this is a, a linear uh, relationship, meaning that with increasing temperature, the amount of heat uh, that is stored is also increasing. This is the most practical form of heat storage, and um, mostly it's done in water, sometimes in, uh, in other liquids or in solids. Two uh, forms, other forms of thermal energy storage are the compact thermal energy storage forms. One is the latent heat and the other one is the sorption heat and chemical heat or thermochemical heat. Latent heat uh, will also be treated by the uh, second speaker, Christoph Ratgeber, in a few minutes. It uh, discusses uh, the work uh, on phase change materials. And these phase change materials have the property that in a certain temperature range, the melting temperature or evaporation temperature, a lot of heat is taken up by the storage material. And this is depicted here to the, to the right, in this figure where you see that at a certain temperature, there is a jump 
in the heat that has been taken up by the material. Uh, typical examples of phase change materials are ice, having the phase change at zero degrees centigrade, and then uh, organic uh, materials like paraffins or inorganic phase change materials like salt hydrates. The third class is uh, thermochemical, uh, subdivided into sorption storage and chemical reaction storage. Here the principles of uh, thermal storage are uh, either physical or chemical. And um, in general, there's no, um, how do you say, uniform picture of how the enthalpy increases with increasing heat, uh, increasing temperature. This um, is very dependent on the uh, type of reaction or the type of material. In general, these two last classes are being uh, treated and um, also studied in the task 58, Annex 33. We call them the compact thermal energy storage. What is the purpose of uh, having compact thermal energy storage? Uh, the first is that it has a higher storage capacity, meaning that you need less volume to store uh, the same amount of heat. And this is, um, this is very important in those areas where the volume is very, um, very costly. Um, another quality, especially for thermochemical materials, is that the losses uh, are minimal. So this means that uh, heat can be stored for long periods without virtual losses. And this makes them especially attractive for long-term storage. Uh, another um, reason for using uh, compact thermal energy storage is that uh, the materials could have an added functionality. For instance, for phase change material, the added functionality is that uh, most of the heat is being stored at a, at a certain fixed temperature, meaning this, that those materials also can be used for, uh, instance, for comfort heating or comfort cooling. For sorption material, uh, there is uh, the property that um, moisture is being taken up by the material, um, leading to the added functionality of drying uh, functionality of this material. The challenges in general for thermal energy storage is that um, the um, that it is dependent on the application, meaning that the temperatures at charging and discharging determine which material can be used in which uh, application, next to the charging and discharging powers, for instance. And the challenge, therefore, is that there is no direct relation between uh, the material properties, the material data, and how this material will, will performance in, perform in a given application. Knowing these challenges, we followed a certain approach uh, in the task, which uh, one of the approaches is the four temperature approach for thermochemical materials, and this is depicted in this figure. Um, to the left-hand side of the yellow dotted line, there is the charging cycle. Uh, there is a source uh, giving heat through a heat exchanger to your thermochemical uh, storage uh, vessel or storage device. But you also need uh, the ambient to get rid of this, uh, this uh, heat. So therefore, two temperatures are uh, important at the charging phase, the charging temperature for the material and the ambient temperature at charging. And then two other temperatures at discharging are important. The temperature at which the consumer needs the, 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 the heat and the temperature at that time of the ambient. So there's a cycle for charging um, at the left-hand side and there's a cycle for discharging at the right-hand side. And these four temperatures determine what the quality of the um, or the performance of the material will be in a certain application for thermochemical materials. Another typical example of how we work is that um, when designing 
uh, an application for thermal energy storage, we first start with the material, for instance, these, these cellulite uh, beads here in the top figure. These materials have certain properties and these, uh, the material properties will determine how a reactor will, will look like. In this example, it's a reactor for another material. It's a, a solid uh, um, sorbent reactor, absorption reactor, reactor. And the qualities and the performance of this reactor will determine how the system will look like. So we have a design approach that from material going to, to, to components and then to the system. But we need another cycle that goes in the, the other direction uh, first calculating what the system performance is for this component and that material, then going back to the component and see what we can improve of the component. Then we have a component performance and from this component performance going back to, to the material, see if we can change the material in order to have a better performing component. And this cycle needs to be gone through several times in order to have an optimized system for a given material and a given component. And that is what uh, we do in, the, in this task. The task is an international collaboration within the International Energy um, Agency. It's task 58 because um, this task is coming from the program Solar Heating and Cooling and it's Annex 33 because it's coming from the program of energy conservation through energy storage. We have a three-year working time started in 2017 and ending this year and the typical um, working is that there's a gathering of experts every half year and these experts are both from the material side and from the application side. So we have a good collaboration between the materials experts and the people knowing how to uh, integrate a storage in a certain application. Next to working on um, the own projects, the experts also work on common goals within the collaboration. This is the task structure. We have two lines, one line working on phase change materials, the vertical line here along the subtasks, and then another vertical line on thermochemical materials. Then we start with the first sub subtask on determining the boundary condition for relevant applications in order to be able to develop components and materials for these applications. This is a common task for phase change material and for thermochemical materials. And the other tasks are divided into two parts, one TCM and one PCM part. Subtask two is about the development and calculations of improved or new materials. Subtask three is on measuring procedures, but using measuring procedures that uh, look into the application conditions. And subtask four is on the development, uh, so the design and development of components for these innovative thermal energy storage materials. As an example for the materials development, you now see here in this graph as a function of temperature here on the x-axis, the energy storage capacity for a given application, and this time the application is for uh, room heating. And uh, on the x-axis, the temperature is given at which the material is being charged, the so-called desorption temperature, because at the moment we are looking into sorption materials. The black triangles show the performance of these sorption materials in this application for the pure sorption materials. And we, uh, the new development now is that to this sorption materials, uh, other materials are being uh, added, salt hydrates, and this leads to a composite material that has better performance. You see this uh, in the performance of the materials with the blue squares and especially this uh, lithium chlor chloride and um, impregnated in vermiculite material. It has a double performance of, uh, of the average of the sorption materials. So this is a, an important development within the uh, subtask on materials. 
another um, uh, another example is for the chemical reactions. Note that here the temperatures are much higher, starting with 300 degrees centigrade up to 800 degrees centigrade, and here is the reaction enthalpy depicted. So typical reaction enthalpies are very distributed for the uh, different materials. Here uh, to uh, champion here is the um, magnesium hydroxide oxide reaction with expanded graphite, which shows that it's uh, between 350 and 400 watt hours per kilogram of enthalpy change at the temperatures of about 370 degrees centigrade. This example shows that there's a lot of work going on for finding uh, new material pairs and new material reactions for typical applications. And here the applications are for storing industrial heat. How this material then is, uh, is used to charge and discharge is an example here from the Technical University of Munich as an example of component development within the task. This device is constructed uh, as, a, um, as a cyclone uh, reactor in which calcium oxide is being mixed with uh, water vapor and then forms calcium hydroxide plus uh, heat in the form of 104 kilojoules per mole. And the, the um, challenge with this reaction is to um, get the heat out at the proper temperatures and get the heat out in an effective way, in, uh, in such a way that all the particles containing this heat are being brought into good contact with the walls of the reactor. And then uh, this reactor is being used to have cycling and um, up until now uh, the technical feasibility was showed or demonstrated up to 20 cycles. Another example of component design is for the phase change materials. Here uh, at the Dalhousie University in Canada, work is being done to uh, design rules for optimizing PCM heat exchanges. And in order to have to find these rules, uh, different configurations in the in form of different sizes, different geometry, different PCM material and operating conditions have to be uh, first um, defined and then experimentally characterized in order to find out what the design rules are. Here's some examples of uh, different geometries. Um, on the top figure, it's a plate heat exchanger, tube heat exchanger, and uh, the lower figure gives an example of a fint tube uh, and coil heat exchanger. An example of um, an application research that uh, is being performed uh, at my own laboratory, my own institute, AE Intech in Austria. We work on uh, compact thermal energy storage for the seasonal storage of solar heat. And um, to the right here, you see the reactor, which, which has a square sh shape. Uh, this contains salt hydrate. And the salt hydrate is being charged and discharged. And when it's being charged, then water vapor um, goes through the condenser, which is on top of the, the middle uh, vessel. And then the condensed water is being stored in the bottom of this middle vessel. And the right vessel is uh, the vessel that uh, is the interface between the heating and cooling of the house and the hot tap water of a house and the compact thermal energy storage system. We developed this, uh, this storage module uh, for 200 kilograms of salt hydrate, and now a system of three vessels is being demonstrated in a house in Poland. These were some examples of, of work that, that we do. It's, it's impossible to, do, to give uh, all examples because it's, it's more than 40 projects uh, from different groups all over the world working on the different aspects of uh, compact thermal energy storage. What is the further development need for co compact thermal energy storage? So what are the, the things that, that we should um, work on also in future? 
we also saw that there is a need for thermal energy storage to replace fossil fuel supply of heat demand and to reduce the necessity for large electricity transport capacity in future because not all energy can be provided by uh, electricity and therefore we need uh, thermal energy storage but thermal energy storage can only be applied if, uh, if we have a cost reduction and this can be um, achieved by having better materials, having better design components and integrate these components and materials uh, in the best way into a system. These are the, the working fields for, for the compact thermal energy storage and uh, we see that first cost effective, effective applications will be in the sectors power to heat, uh, industrial heat and in those sectors that have added functionality for compact thermal energy storage. So what are the next steps in future to, uh, to make sure that compact thermal energy storage find its place in, uh, in the energy world? We will continue with the design approach, working on materials, components and uh, the systems. We couple compact thermal energy storage research and development to the high potential application areas. We find novel ways for the development processes. We have to formulate new challenges for continued uh, IEA collaboration, not only in our fields, but also perhaps in uh, other fields for system integration and digitalization. And we will address some challenges uh, through mission innovation uh, activities. And one of them is already starting. It's working on a roadmap for thermal energy storage materials acceleration platforms. And last but not least, what we also need to do is uh, provide the decision makers with good information on the potential and the necessary research and development steps uh, for compact thermal energy storage. This is what, uh, what I would like to show about uh, this, this part, this introduction, and I'm happy to, uh, to answer your questions. Yeah, thank you, Wim. I think this was a very um, extra good interview uh, overview of a complex research field, really impressive with 30 projects you're managing. And I think this shows already the value sort of of this international research platform that you exchange and that you uh, learn from each other and profit from each other experiences to speed up this important field. So, Wim, thank you very much. And um, we go over to the second speaker. We have today three speakers and we will go through their presentations first and then we have a Q&A session. So you're very welcome to uh, type in your questions in the meanwhile. Our next speaker is Christoph Ratgeber. He's working at, at a research assistant in the Thermal Energy Storage Group at ZAE Bayern, which is a Bavarian research institute in Germany. And he is there since 2012. He is, as Wim already said, a dedicated expert on Latin heat storages with phase change materials. And he has been participating in IEA solar heating and cooling programs since 2013. His topic today is material development for low temperature Latin heat storage. Christoph, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thanks for your introduction, Bärbel. Uh, good afternoon from my side. My presentation today is about the development of materials for low temperature latent heat storage. <clears throat> for this purpose, uh, we are using uh, salt hydrates and mixtures of salt hydrates. And uh, here is the uh, outline of my today's presentation. First, I'd like to give you the motivation for using salt hydrates as phase change materials and latent heat storage systems. And uh, then I will show you how these mixtures are being developed and characterized. And at the end, um, I'd like to give you an application examples where these kinds of phase change materials are applied. So first, uh, let's start with the basic principle. As Wim already showed, the <clears throat> first uh, technology uh, to store thermal energy is called sensible heat storage. There is a almost linear relationship 
between the amount of stored heat and the temperature. That means rising the temperature um, uh, rises the amount of stored or released heat. Now looking at uh, phase change materials, the situation is as follows. If we look at a certain temperature range between two temperatures, and if a material undergoes a transition from solid to liquid state in this temperature range, then the amount of stored heat is comparably higher using phase change materials than sensible heat storage medium. So in most technical applications, the interesting phase change is from solid to liquid and the other way around. Examples of this technology um, as Wim already introduced, is ice, the transition from ice to water at zero degrees C, or what is also very well known are these heat packs. Um, they are using a salt hydrate with a melting temperature around 58 degrees C. So, as you see on the figure, um, PCM phase change materials provide a high amount of stored heat in a narrow temperature range around their phase change and that uh, that means that each application requires a material with a suitable transition temperature let's say it's suitable melting temperature for the low temperature range uh, salt hydrates are most interesting on, on the left, you see a figure with the different material classes that are being discussed or applied as PCM, um, several organic and inorganic materials, and in the range from zero to 100 degrees, salt hydrates offer higher melting entropies in terms of uh, energy density per volume at comparably low costs. An example of a salt hydrate would be calcium chloride a hexahydrate, so the, cell, the salt is uh, calcium chloride and six moles of water are coordinated around the salt. However, there are today several temperature ranges without cost-effective PCM and as pure substances are mostly known, we are developing salt hydrate mixtures as to create new PCM. So how does it look like to develop salt hydrate mixtures as latent heat storage materials? In our case, we were following this line of development. Um, in the first step, we calculate mixtures and therefore or we do this to identify eutectic mixtures. I will show you later on why we are doing this. Um, after the calculation, the calculated, the predicted eutectic composition needs to be experimentally verified. If this verification is successful, we are performing thermal cycling tests to test the material under application conditions. And if also these tests, uh, tests are successful, then uh, we have developed successfully a new PCM. So for the first step, the calculation of eutectic mixtures. Um, why are we doing this? Uh, here um, a simple phase diagram is shown in the figure. So to keep it simple, the line um, illustrates the solubility threshold or illustrates the transition in temperature between the liquid and the solid. So above the line everything is a liquid solution and below several or different uh, solid phases uh, precipitate. And as it is marked here in this system, lithium nitrate and water, there's a binary eutectic. And this is interesting as uh, to be used as PCM. If you would, for example, um, cycle it or use it in uh, the temperature range that is shown here, then we can expect a reproducible transition from solid to liquid and vice versa. Uh, and this in a short temperature range. So eutectics, um, in theory, they have a reproducible phase transition and as binary eutectics, as the example shows one, are mostly known, our approach is to calculate ternary systems containing two salts and water. 
And uh, in this case, in the case of ternary systems, the example given here is lithium nitrate and magnesium nitrate in water. And now we have different liquidous surfaces in this uh, diagram. So you see the base of the diagram, that's the composition triangle. And in the vertical direction, the temperature is uh, plotted. And um, here are the different solid phases that occur in the system, the two anhydrates and then several salt hydrates. What is interesting in terms of PCM development is now the location of the ternary eutectics. In this system, there are several two types of eutectics occur, ternary eutectics and so-called pseudobinary eutectics. And uh, so for the calculation, uh, the result is the composition and the temperature of these eutectics as given, as indicated in the table at the bottom. So for the pseudobinary eutectics, we have two solid phases uh, in equilibrium with solution. And in the ternary eutectic, there are three solid phases in equilibrium with salt solution. So having calculated, having predicted these eutectic compositions, it's important to experimentally verify um, the calculations. So at first, it's important to determine the concentration of the salt solutions we are measuring. Therefore, we determine the water content using either a moisture analyzer or titration. Uh, titration, a different type of titration is also used to uh, measure the concentration of different salt ions. Then having, let's say, verified that we are measuring what we want to measure, so having verified the concentration of the salt solution, we are performing calorimetry. So now the presentation stopped. I don't know why. Let me check this. Hmm. Okay, I think I started again from this slide. Okay, so now we can go on. Um, the second step is to perform calorimetric measurements, therefore we're using a DSC, differential scanning calorimetry. Um, to explain it a bit more, a bit more in detail, I'll give you a, a brief and easy, a rather simple example. So uh, here it's uh, the ternary system containing ammonium nitrate, lithium nitrate and water. Shown on the left is the phase diagram the three solid phases that occur here and um, indicated as a black ball is the location of the ternary eutectic. So in the calculation step, um, the information that we get is the three phases that are in equilibrium with the salt solution, their composition, the eutectic composition and the eutectic temperature as indicated here. And now we are performing calorimetric measurements, DSC measurements, with a sample of that composition. Uh, and in this case, it's an example of a successful verification. And there's a successful verification because what we observe is a single and quite narrow melting transition. So this is shown by the red curve. Blue one is upon cooling, the red one is upon heating. So this eutectic is experimentally verified. Uh, the next step is to perform thermal cycling tests. The idea of thermal cycling tests is to, um, yeah, to, to validate that the PCM can be used over many heating, cooling, melting, crystallization cycles, um, and thereby taking into account uh, the requirements or the conditions of the applications. So what we are doing in thermal cycling is uh, shown on the right is shown the temperature program. So that means we have um, the PCM and this is subjected to repeated um, heating and cooling. And what we found out, what is uh, very important and also very useful is to have a visual investigation of phase separation. And therefore we 
measuring the, the eutectics in, uh, in such uh, transparent bottles, put them in a thermotactic bath, and then uh, we're taking pictures during the thermal cycles. And this is shown on uh, the, this slide. Um, uh, at the top, you see the situation after the first cycle. So both samples shown here are completely in the liquid state as they should be. So this is the situation after cycle one at the high temperature. Uh, however, after cycle 15, you can see for sample number 60, there's um, some kind of solid material at the bottom, uh, which indicates uh, phase separation. And then continuing the, the cycling after cycle 135, uh, there's still some solid material um, on the right uh, sample at the bottom, but uh, what is also visible is that the amount has slightly decreased. So there seems to be a kind of, of uh, stabilization process. Now I'd like to show you a possible application of salt hydrates in the context of low temperature latent heat storage. The application is a system providing solar heating and cooling with the combination of an absorption chiller and the latent heat storage. So how does it work? Um, at day, the system is driven by a solar thermal collector providing heat at 90 degrees C to a thermally driven absorption chiller, which in turn provides cool cold at 15 degrees C to a cooling system. And to keep this process running, Heat needs to be rejected. So this is now the green uh, green circle. Heat needs to be rejected at 40 degrees C. And in this case, this is done uh, partly by a dry recooler and partly by storing the heat in the latent heat storage. Storing here means um, melting the PCM. Uh, of course, to regenerate the storage, uh, at night, um, the system is operated in that way that the latent heat storage is unloaded using colder air of uh, the night. For this system, we were using calcium chloride uh, hexahydrate with a melting temperature of 29 uh, degrees C, which is yeah, which suits well to the application uh, temperatures. On this uh, slide, you see a, a picture of the storage that had be, has been used in the installation. Um, as I said, the PCM is calcium chloride hexahydrate with a melting temperature of 29 degrees C. There are two types of storages, one with one and one with one and a half cubic meter storage volume. And as you can read, um, the capacity is either 80 or 120 kilowatt hours in the temperature range between 22 to 36 degrees C. So what is what is the, the special feature of this type of storage is we are using a so-called capillary heat and tube exchanger, um, which is immersed in the liquid PCM. So the blue capillary tubes are uh, made from plastic to account for the corrosive properties of the salt hydrate. And the picture in the, in the middle, um, shows the PCM crystallizing on the surface of these capillary tubes. Uh, with this uh, system, is, it has been in operation for, for, for several years, and here you see the results of the thermal cycling at uh, storage level, and um, again, uh, applying charging temperature of 36 and a discharging temperature of 22 degrees C and uh, thereby we could um, validate the thermal cycling stability for this material in this uh, storage configuration. So now I'd like to come to the summary of this presentation. Material development of low temperature latent heat storage uh, has been carried out in several steps. The first um, point is to uh, develop PCM 
based on salt hydrate mixtures. This is done by calculating solid liquid phase diagrams to identify eutectic mixtures and then by experimentally um, verifying the predicted compositions using calorimetry. Uh, the, the second step would be to thermal cycling, to perform thermal cycling tests in order to check the long-term performance of these materials. And as, as you have seen, um, it is very useful to uh, visually investigate the phase separation or to visually investigate the phase transition and thereby being able to, to, to investigate uh, possible phase separation processes. And in the end, um, this material development can be transferred to, to the concept of uh, low temperature latent heat storage using an immersed capillary um, tube heat exchanger. Um, and also at this storage level, it's important to perform um, testing under application conditions to ensure the, yeah, the long-term performance of these materials. Uh, that's it from my side. Thanks for listening and um, I'm looking forward to the Q&A session. Thank you, Christoph. To let us look a bit into the really laboratory work, um, this provoked a lot of very dedicated questions that we will raise at the end. Um, and we will give the floor first to Benjamin Fumé. He is a research engineer and a PhD candidate at the Swiss Federal Institute for Material Science and Technology. He is electrical engineer and has more than 12 years of R&D experience in thermal storage. One of his current focus research areas is components and systems for sorption-based seasonal thermal storage for buildings. Today he will speak about component development for liquid sorption thermal energy storage systems. So Benjamin, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Um, yeah, we're going to go right into looking at some of the activities that we did in uh, subtask four, components and system development, and I'll use um, the work that we're doing on liquid sorption heat storage for as an example. Now, um, exactly, as Vim had already mentioned, we've got a whole lot of different uh, demonstrator lab scale systems being reported and all sorts of um, different processes and of course power and capacity and applications found and um, we see that um, one of the main um, focuses or the, the, the challenges is really the heat and mass exchanger for these absorption heat storage systems. Now um, Exactly, and and what we've what we've understood is that we need a a common basis really to to make a comparison of these systems and to understand progress in the field. So um, in in the, in our subtask, we've we've found these two um, basic um, evaluation levels which uh, we see here the uh, four performance criterias one which we call gross temperature lift then of course volumetric energy density power density and and uh, finally round trip efficiency and we see that we've got this um, we can do this evaluation on four basic different levels material bulk uh, component and on a system level and um, what we also see is we've got all sorts of varying process types and and many different um, temperature profiles being used so in in other words to be able to get a common common basis for um, for comparison uh, we need to first um, define some realistic temperatures and uh, we've we've gone into looking at what are realistic temperatures and what I'll show here now is the temperature is a part of, of a temperature definition that 
we have made for a building application because as we know sorption heat storage works as as a um, chemical heat pump and uh, temperatures very strongly affect uh, the the performance of of the material component and and of course finally of the system um without going much further into these these temperatures here here you see uh, vim had pointed out we need charging temperatures we need we need uh, ambient temperatures for a heat sink we need um source temperatures in in um discharging and um we in this case here need a certain space heating temperature in with defining these temperatures it is possible to um, actually evaluate um, right from from the materials from the milligram uh, level materials to the system um, performance of material performance of material in component and and in system so this is one of the um, very important um, initial um uh, common grounds that that we have we have defined now for building applications we see we've got all sorts of varying systems and um going looking into this the question is is it possible to to sort of define um basic processes of these different systems to be able to look into into the basic processes and even there already find some of some of the the possible um, um, performance uh, reductions coming from material to to the system level we've defined um, systems as follows um, comparing open to closed here on on the x-axis um referring to um exposure to air and um and transported and fixed referring to the um the sorption material being stationary uh meaning fixed or being transported as would usually be done in a liquid uh, sorption heat storage um in the transport so we have four basic um, storage processes that we've defined and um, further details would be found in the um, publication uh, mentioned below just uh, a brief um, point to set here is that we do find that the close transported uh, system has some benefits to to the others in in respect to closed having um, a higher vapor pressure and thus in discharging a better uh, discharging performance and also transported um, being able to to um, absorb to cool down the absorbent further especially if there's a counter flow process between the heat uh, transport fluid and the sorbent and thus be able to discharge um, better so we already see that that um, the choice of system process does have uh, an effect on the performance of the material going on now with with the temperature profiles that we have defined we can on a uh, material level um, evaluate uh, the the maximum the, the performance of of such a material and it's it's very very important uh, i show this here now for for sodium hydroxide we have the uh, vapor um, a water vapor pressure on the y-axis temperature um, of the aqueous sodium hydroxide on the x-axis and of course depending on what sort of temperatures i work with i get um, a different different performance here in respect to um, the temperature lift the gross temperature lift that i require for the charging which is the the, the upper line and um, the gross temperature lift that I'm able to reach in the discharging and of course very important in the discharging also the minimum concentration that I'm 
that that I will get, which then defines um, my uh, or leads to to my maximum energy density that that I can reach here. Just to point out, you see in the red dashed line is the fact that in in our case with sodium hydroxide, we do not want to go beyond 58 percent because we have a liquid um sorption uh, system and um, sodium hydroxide tends to um, crystallize above um, 58 percent in room temperature so we, we already see here now with these defined temperatures we see oh we have a slight um, uh, limitation in our case with sodium hydroxide um, in in the application another method to to present this which is which is a sort of a mapping which is nice to to start with with a um with a theoretical um, performance and then also place into this diagram the performance um of components and systems is is what we we see here we have on the x axis the gross temperature lift which means the temperature difference between the um, desorber and the condenser in in the uh, charging process and the uh, evaporator and the absorber in the in the discharging um, process on the x axis on the y axis we have the uh, mass fraction, the mass fraction or concentration of, in our case, of, of the sodium hydroxide. Um, and the blue line is the vapor pressure line in um, um, uh, here, in, in our case, at an evaporating temperature of, of four degrees. And, and uh, absorption is always going to be above the line and desorption is going to be below the line. And very important for heat storage here is we want to be able to perform close to this um, equilibrium line. And um, you also see that in, in this desorption, the gross temperature lift, the practical gross temperature lift is always going to be slightly um, uh, greater than the equilibrium in, in the absorption, it's going to be less. And, and here we already can point to a uh, loss in, in the gross temperature lift, or if we define it as the temperature effectiveness would be the gross temperature lift in absorption divided by gross temperature lift in the desorption. This is also further alluded to in um, the below mentioned publication. When we look at the vapor uh, pressure equilibrium lines uh, stated by, based on the uh, temperatures that, that we define, we see here that we um, already, because the, in, in uh, the charging, we have a higher condensation temperature than in the discharging the evaporator temperature, we of course have gross temperature loss just due to the specific application and also more importantly what we see here is that in the discharging um, because of the low vapor uh, pressure we cannot discharge to to this the same um, final mass fraction as would be possible with higher evaporating temperature so mm, just pointing to the fact that it's very important to have, have a common basis on the um, temperatures that we work with. Now, if we go to um, have a look uh, in, it's still in a theoretical evalu evaluation on volumetric energy density, um, very important to uh, base this on the maximum volume of the storage material. This is done here in this, in this diagram for sodium hydroxide, starting at 50, uh, 58%, and then depending on, on how much we can dilute it, we, we have a um, respective theoretical energy density. And I've Drawn in two lines here, just pointing to to the um, already due to the application and the different vapor pressures in charging and discharging. 
seeing that because we have lower vapor pressure in discharging, we have we could reach a lower uh, energy density. In this case, the 162 um, kilowatt hours per cubic meter um, compared to the 190. One more time, this is in, in respect to the, um, the maximum volume, which in our case would be the charged, um, so separated uh, sodium hydroxide from the evaporating water. Now, um, going into uh, volumetric power, which is, which is not really, uh, evaluation on the material level is not really possible here because it has a lot to do with, with components, but there is, um, there is on, on, the, on the bulk scale, so on, on the gram scale um, evaluation, there are possibilities to, to see um, a behavior. We have a uh, build a, a sort of a bulk um, level um, heat and mass exchanger device that I show here, a large evaporator condenser on the left side and an absorber desorber um, on the right side connected with with a um, flexible stainless steel tube and uh, what we do here is measure the uh, mass uptake um, of a still film in this case of sodium hydroxide in the absorber desorber you can imagine it was quite challenging to um, actually get the scale only to measure the mass uptake and not also all sorts of effects due to um, the um, connections involved. But from, from this, um, this evaluation, I can show here one, um, one measurement where we um, See, see, have have an idea of of the power performance um, of this thin film of sodium hydroxide. The um, purple in purple is the mass uptake, and um, then in orange and uh, sorry, in in gray and green is the um, the the power. And uh, we see that um, once starting absorption here, so we, um, we started with concentrated sodium hydroxide, 58%, um, we have a, a, tr a tremendous uh, um, peak of, of, of power, power peak at first. We, in our case here, we, we um, have about 36 uh, watts at, at first but it but um very rapid uh, uh, decline of the power as the um as mass is or water vapor is um, absorbed and the concentration reduces and all after 30 minutes we we have uh, only about five watts um but we have not reached the equilibrium um state of our sodium hydroxide and um, and in other words this points to the fact that um, for heat storage where it is very important to be close to equilibrium line to reach high energy density um, we're going to have a heat and mass exchanger that that is is not power optimized but uh, needs to take in account the uh, low power um, in the process of of moving towards an equilibrium state of the concentration of the sorbent to the vapor pressure. Now, with this in in mind, going to component design. Um, in our liquid absorption heat storage, we 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 find that. This is a similar process as, as for example, a um, chiller or a um, also a heat pump, uh, absorption heat pump. Nevertheless, um, with including the storage 
in other words, the um, storage of concentrated sorbent and, and sorbate in charged state and then um, and uh, discharge state storing of, of the uh, diluted uh, sorbent for recharging. We have um, a process where we need to be able to reach this maximum discharging in in a single single um, pass of the um, sorbent through the heat and mass exchanger. For this reason, we find for the liquid uh, sorbents the um, tube bundle falling film and uh, heat and mass exchanger as used for um, for chillers and for heat pumps is not ideal. So we've we've gone towards developing a um, a spiral fin um, tube uh, heat and mass exchanger, also reported in the below um, a publication. And one of the one of the main things that we reach here is, is we reach a much uh, longer exposure time of the sorbent, which is needed to be able to move there towards that that equilibrium line to be able to get those high energy densities and. Um, We've done numerous tests with, with this here. For example, we have an exposure time of the sodium hydroxide of about 12, 12 minutes in, in an ice counter flow. So we're able to cool down the, um, the sorbent right to the, the input um, fluid temperature and uh, reach a, a continuous process and, and reach a maximum uh, temperature um, gain gross temperature lift because there's always a, a fresh sodium hydroxide uh, introduced to the top of the spiral fin. And um, we've, we've tested this now in a, in a lab scale uh, set up with a single tube as shown, shown here. On one side, the absorber, desorber, um, a similar build, the evaporator condenser. And um, here are now some of the um, performance um, uh, or the performance we, we reached with with our setup here again shown in this gross temperature lift and mass uh, fraction um, mapping and uh, the red here now the equilibrium line at uh, 20 degrees uh, at the moment it, I show this equilibrium line because these tests were tested at or, or the, these tests were done at um, a condensing and evaporating temperature of 20 degrees, which, which must state now, as, as we um, saw previously from, from the realistic temperatures, is, is of course not quite um, fitting. But nevertheless, as an example here, we can show that um, depending, for example, on, on the um, uh, mass flow, so how much uh, sodium hydroxide um, flows, uh, grams per minute flows on the heat mass exchanger, we uh, see that we're closer or, or not so close to, to the equilibrium line. Here on the, on the left bottom is a discharged um, state and uh, it is, it is seen that even though a mass flow is increased, uh, the 11 grams per minute compared to the 2.3 grams per minute, the power is not substantially increased, but we divert away from the equilibrium line. So we do see in these tests now that we have um, a limitation in the uh, uh, mass uptake. And um, and so a lot of our work now focuses on uh, on working on increasing the the mass uptake while still um, having long exposure times and being close to equilibrium, which is uh, a must for for high energy densities. So to conclude here, I've uh, we've. In the, in the task, um, being able to um, define uh, the four basic processes and evaluate these and show that on the process uh, level there are 
benefits of some processes to, to the others. We've been able to uh, define for building heating storage uh, applications uh, testing temperatures which enable now to evaluate performance of material from or from from evaluate performance from material level to to components and system level and also comparison of different materials and different systems uh, is is made possible in as far as these temperature profiles are abided to and uh, emphasis on on the fact that um, absorption heat storage is a different different pro or similar process to to absorption uh, chilling and and uh, absorption heat pumps but in a sense that we need to um, be close to equilibrium line because of the energy density which of course in a chiller or um, absorption heat pump is not not in a major focus or not not a focus at all. Um, for this reason, um, we need to be aware that often heat storage systems will require different types of heat and mass exchangers to the chiller and heat pump. Thank you for your attention and um, if there's questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you, Benjamin. Very interesting insight uh, presentation. Now we have uh, a good uh, last 20 minutes for some Q&A session. Uh, I would like to start with a more general questions and uh, Wim, um, I would like to ask you, um, we had a speaker who is interested in whether there's research going on to find uh, compact storage materials that can work both in heating and cooling modes, meaning that if you have a certain period where you need cooling needs, you can switch over like to having a hot water period or whatever in the other part of the year. Please Wim. That's a, thank you. That's a very good question, and uh, um, I do not immediately know of research that is going on in this field because it would be really a material that that would be switchable. It, it has been discussed uh, a few years ago to to work on this possibility, but I'm, I'm not aware of, of of a group now at the moment that is working on that. So so another another task for your new research group. <laughs> Yeah, possibly. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah. And then we have regarding uh, other uh, PCMs, oh no, uh, yeah, phase change materials. I think there are a number of questions to Christoph. Um, first, I would like to start with a general one. Somebody asked for a PCM material that could be recommendable for temperature range from 22 to 30 degree. Okay, so one of the materials I already uh, showed in my presentation is calcium chloride hexahydrate melting at 29 degrees C and as this is a very favorable material regarding costs and energy density uh, in, in this temperature range either using uh, the, the calcium chloride hexahydrate itself at 29 or preparing mixtures with calcium chloride hexahydrate as one of the components would be an, an option in this temperature range. Okay, perfect. Um, also regarding your presentation, there were some technical questions on your methodology. Somebody asked, which numerical method is generally accepted to design and analyze the behavior of phase change materials from India? Um, yeah, well, this is a very broad pr pr uh, question. I, I, I try to, to uh, ask for more details. So uh, for, uh, for the PCM material on um, on the material level, the the simulations that you or the the numerical calculations strongly depend on the type of material class. So we're using um, a model to calculate these phase diagrams, which can be used for salt hydrates, so for concentrated salt solutions. In other cases, for organic PCMs, you would need different um, numerical or different simulations um, because of the different nature of the um, of the materials. They're different molecular structure so for the material level it depends on the material class and for the system level I think there's a huge variety of, of numerical methods yeah? and I, I wouldn't say that there's only one that is generally accepted. 
Okay, still some research necessary. Um, then there was a specific question on your calimetry. Somebody commented whether two Kelvin per minute might be a bit too fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, for us, as we were, I didn't show that, as we were screening, uh, yeah, really a, a large number of materials, more than 100, yeah. Um, the using two Kelvin per minute is a good is a good compromise uh, in order to to check if the the phase change from um, from solid to liquid so the melting transition if this occurs in a single step um, so for this uh, for this verification uh, measurement the the important question was if is the melting in occurs it in a single step and therefore two Kelvin is a, is a good compromise between uh, accuracy and um, and and measuring time of course if you want to um, analyze the material it's it's melting temperature more accurately then you um, might uh, need slower temperatures um, actually in this uh, i8 annex we also developed um, procedure for dynamic dsc measurements and one important step in the procedure is to perform a heating rate test in order to identify the, the proper heating rates. And usually, yeah, that's right, they are slower. I don't know, maybe around 0.5 Kelvin per minute. Okay. Um, last question to your presentation. Somebody wanted to know more on this twist technology, the component that was developed in Munich. Well, I think that was Wim's presentation. Maybe a question oh. to, to Wim. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was in my presentation. I already uh, uh, also published the link to the website of this group, so that, that can, more information can be found on this group. It's from the Technical University of Munich. Okay, thank you. Benjamin, a challenging question for you. An inexpensive TCM for about 150 degree. Market ready? <laughs> Very specific well, I, questions I gotta, here. I, yeah, this is very specific, and I'm I'm sorry, I've got to pass on that one. I mean, we um, maybe maybe Vim can can give some more information. We uh, work solely on on liquid sorbents um, at at EMPA, and and the, these are low temperature um, for building applications, and and. It, we specifically look at these building applications and and uh, 150 degrees is is too high for us because we don't because we don't have these temperatures available for for charging so but maybe then yeah um that's that's a, a good question because this temperature range say be, between 120 and 250 degrees centigrade is a is a difficult one most chemical reactions start at say 250 300 degrees and um, this this leads to that only sorption materials uh, so zeolites or uh, aluminum aluminum uh, phosphates would be suited for for the intermediate temperatures as a thermochemical material um, we uh, at a intec work with uh, zeolite 13x that uh, will be charged by solar um, vacuum tubes at, at 180 degrees. So this this could be could be one of the possibilities. Okay. Well, I think that we have from the names actually. I I have a feeling that we have a lot of. Uh, um, participants from India. So I want to raise this question: What happens if you go into hot climates? Um, for, uh, reply, applying your, you know, test methodologies. Does it work as well in in hotter surroundings, or do you have to adapt your research on materials for compact storages, Wim? The uh, chances for, especially for sorption materials, is that they also can provide cooling. So, so this uh, then the, there would be a double function of uh, storing heat, but also storing the possibility to cool. And definitely yes. Um, also for PCM materials, uh, if you look to, into applications for for hotter climates, then the phase change material research will uh, uh, work more on uh, cooling purposes. So temperatures to be stored below, say, 15 degrees centigrade, than for heating purposes. Okay. 
Well, um, there was quest one question. I'm not sure who to address this to. It says, is there, is there, has there been research or to use of metal organic framework MOF materials for thermal energy storage through moisture absorption? I think that was yeah, probably I, I touched on this yes. one. Yeah, metal organic frameworks works are um, say or organic molecules with a metal atom that have the possibility to take up a lot of water, uh, even more kilograms of water than kilogram of uh, the pure material. Um, they are being investigated at the moment mostly for heat pump purposes. And this is because of the high cost of the material. There has been up until now, no real uh, jump into the cost reduction for the production of these materials. So only in smaller quantities, these materials can find their way to a technical application, meaning that uh, for, for instance, for, for thermal storage for larger quantities, like for daily or for seasonal storage, at the moment, these glass materials still are too, uh, too costly. Okay. Um, there are now some questions coming up which are interesting as well, looking more at a strategic point of view. People are asking how to get an overview on, let's say, all the um, TCS uh, project, uh, like research projects worldwide, or maybe material-wise, WIM. Um, how about overviews? Do you do a report on this in your task, or how can people access your knowledge and these big overview you have in your research group? Yeah, we, we try to make overviews also uh, through the link to our website, the task website. Um, there are regular also some review uh, uh, articles. Uh, a recent one was, uh, I think, one and a half year ago on the different uh, researches on, on thermochemical area. Um, but we do not pretend to know all the projects uh, worldwide. The, the <laughs> focus is, is on European uh, project, uh, groups, some Canadian. Uh, but, but to be to be honest, I'm, I'm not aware what is going on, for instance, in India or in China. Okay, I think there seems to, to be some interesting contacts here and people are asking for email contacts to continue the discussion. Um, I'm sure, Wim, you had your email at the back of your presentation and I'm, the presentations will be also available um, with the download of the whole um, audio of the webinar. So there's for sure a chance to um, get to know the speakers and get in contact with them. And, um, you know, maybe we should give again the indication that ia-shc.org has a website particularly on task 58 and under the icon publications you find these regular publications of the task that uh, Wim was mentioning. Yes. So there was another um, question uh, looking into whether you can get information on the materials that are researched or developed. Can you maybe point to this um, wiki media page where materials are described or is this not in this context? Yeah, there's this one wiki, wiki page uh, being developed on phase change materials and the, we are also working on a materials database which is more developed for phase change materials. There are some, I think now some 10 to 15 materials in the database and um, starting with uh, sorption and uh, thermochemical materials, uh, chemical reactions. So the idea is that, that we have a, a common database um, in which only the, uh, say, data or mostly the data that have been um, extracted from, from materials uh, according to the uh, agreed upon measuring, material, uh, measuring method, that these data will be published on this uh, materials database. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Christoph, a question, a more general one to your side, uh, asking you what you do against phase separation to overcome this phase separation of materials. So, uh, basically, these kind of eutectics uh, should not be subjected or should not be, should not suffer from safe phase separation. If the calculation was correct and if the correct concentration was uh, was was measured so however several other salts um, are, are not um, are not stable without um, let's say without either modifying the material or 
uh, providing some kind of um, anti-phase separation units on, on storage levels. So there, there are different types of possibilities. And um, so uh, regarding what I, the, the, the samples that I showed, um, there was one where uh, phase separation occurred. And this is for us an indication that the correct um, composition or that the composition was not correctly uh, calculated. And then on material level, there's the, the possibility, for example, to use thickening agents. There's a lot of literature on that. Uh, that's a kind of gelling um, procedure. And uh, the, yeah, the, the, the other way is to, uh, to have a kind of, of, of mechanism of process on uh, on storage level to prevent this. Okay, thank you. Another challenging question from my side, I just would address it to Wim. Um, somebody asked that it's a, regarding cooling 130 to 360 degree and they said we presented, we presently use um, aerial Cretol melting point 180 degree, but we would like to use a PCM with higher temperatures. Do you have any recommendations? Mm, at the moment, no. I have to dive more into that. that perhaps Christoph uh, knows more on this phase change material. Yeah. So, so my suggestion would be so erythritol. That's a sugar alcohol, and these are limited to. Yeah, temperatures in, in this range, and there's also always a problem in in temperature stability uh, that the materials do not degrade. At um, then at higher temperatures, for example, 200, 300 degrees C, uh, mixtures of salts are, are are interesting to to be used as PCM. So not as in my case, mixtures of salt and water. Uh, just mixtures of different salts without water, and this is used, if, for example, in concentrated uh, solar thermal, uh, concentrated solar power uh, systems using molten salt systems, and you can use these molten salts also as uh, as PCM. Okay, perfect. A last question regarding supercooling phenomena. It's modeling and overcoming this phenomena. How can you explain supercooling phenomena? Is somebody asking? Yeah, well, supercooling is also um, a PCM phenomenon. So uh, uh, I showed you several uh, heating and cooling curves, and supercooling means that the that the temperature upon cooling, where the crystallization, the solidification starts, this is uh, somehow lower than the melting temperature. So you have some some temperature offset, and that can be difficult in applications. Um, first, um, in, in DSC measurements using small sample sizes, this is uh, typically um, yeah very very large. We have a high degree of supercooling, and then going to application scale using I don't know one cubic meter of material, uh, which is not laboratory but technical grade supercooling is usually uh, reduced um, and well well for modeling of supercooling I think there it's best to to check the literature so there's no short answer to modeling of supercooling <laughs> okay well I hope that um, all of your our many many question raisers are happy now and we have uh, at least tackled some of their questions. I would like to thank the three speakers um, for their really engaged presentations and the audience for their very challenging questions and I hand over to Jenny for the final words and to wish you a nice evening or rest of the day. Thank you very much. Great, uh, thank you very much. Um, First of all, to Bim, Christoph, and Benjamin for your excellent presentations, and to uh, Barb Bebel for moderating the session today. Um, your presentations were very well prepared, and I think we all got a very um, good overview of, of the technology. And thank you also to the audience for your for your conversation for your questions and the good conversation. Um, I just wanted to make a, another quick announcement about the recording. Um, They'll be, it'll be available within the next one to, one to two days after the webinar on ISIS and the IA Solar Heating Cooling websites. For ISIS members, you have uh, access to all the ISIS webinars and presentations in the member area. Um, <clears throat> another benefit of joining, so we welcome you, anyone to do that. 
Um, a quick announcement about our next uh, ISIS um, webinar together with IE Solar Heating Cooling Solar Academy. It will be taking place in January. The date will be announced soon, so look out for our next announcements about it on an important topic of renovating historical buildings towards zero energy. This is from Task 59 of the Solar Heating Cooling Program. So very much looking forward to that next uh, webinar with Solar Heating and Cooling. Um, finally, we appreciate your participation and we welcome you to provide your feedback on this webinar. Uh, please write to us at public.relations at isis.org with any comments or questions about this or other ISIS events. And we also welcome you to complete the survey, which will be sent to you by email. It's important feedback to help us improve these events. And don't forget to follow us on social media. So thank you again, everyone, also for wrapping up on time. And uh, look forward to seeing you at another webinar again soon. Thanks.